This is Center Stage, putting your firm in the spotlight by highlighting business owners and other industry experts to help take your firm to the next level. Hey everyone, and welcome to Center Stage. I'm your host, John Henson, and this week, getting back into just the basics of your marketing and talking about what it takes to build a good marketing strategy. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of layers to it um, that you know, kind of coincide with your marketing plan that we talked about a few weeks ago, but you know, your marketing plan is just one piece of your overall marketing strategy. And so we're going to kind of expand out, talk about, you know, the, the other important elements of your marketing strategy and, and where to get started with that. And so joining us this week, uh, someone who has a lot of experience doing this, uh, he built a really good marketing strategy for himself, uh, used it to become one of the top wholesalers in the entire country of Canada for several years in a row. And that is Mr. Warren Miles Pickup. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. So yeah, real quick, um, you know, kind of tell us a little bit more about your background and, and what brought you here today. Sure. Um, I spent uh, about 15 years in, in the finance industry, uh, worked from being a, a bank teller up to doing high net worth financial planning with a, a company out of Vancouver called Nicola Wealth Management, uh, moved into the investment management side, working for a couple of different uh, mutual fund uh, wholesaling and uh, and production manufacturing businesses. Uh, that's where I was very fortunate to be recognized by Wealth Professional as uh, one of the top wholesalers in in Canada. Um, and then wound on wound up uh, starting my own practice uh, with a business partner, and have just uh, am just in the process of finishing up my first book on marketing for financial advisors. Um, as you mentioned, you know I was able to to be named as one of the the top wholesalers in in Canada really took a different approach than a lot of wholesalers um or advisors you know that are very product focused and i i wanted yeah. to be very consultative focused in in what i was doing and that's true to the book that i've uh written now where it's it's really about taking a step back and understanding the key problems of your audience and and of the people that you're you're serving because uh, I really believe sales is a is a service role um, yeah. in order to to help them accomplish things and and solve uh, solve problems that exist in their lives. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I like that you're doing, I mean, you know, the this book that you're doing now, you know, technically geared more towards people in the finance industry. But, mm -hmm. you know, you and I were talking before you have plans yeah. to do a version of it for different industries. And I think that's great because, you know, and I imagine you're not going to have to revise a ton of it. It's really just kind of the audience specific language for it. And that's I think a exactly. big part of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and a big part of that is, is just because, you know, despite, you know, what, you know, cause I mean, our audience is mostly lawyers. We do have, you know, quite a few financial people. And one of the things I hear a lot is, well, you know, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have a really specific niche, you know, marketing for my industry is very specific and special and no one knows how to do it better than I do. But that's not really true because the same sort of broad marketing principles can be applied across all the different industries. I think the more unique your niche is, the better and the more the strategy works because it, it it's it's really so pinpoint focused on identifying the niche issues that your audience faces that yeah. uh it, it makes it even better right it makes right. this 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 strategy even more effective and so you know i think um no matter what industry you're in this is very applicable and and a big part of the book that i've written is about accountability which is no matter how niche you are accountability is the thing that matters Taking a strategy yeah. and actually turning it into a plan that's implementable on a daily basis is what leads to success. It's not necessarily having this grand 10,000 foot view uh, strategy and then, you know, all these these action steps that you're going to take. If you don't do them on a daily basis, it doesn't matter. And so yeah. the, the book, you know, in repurposing it for different industries is really more about accountability than it is about uh, you know, making sure that you have the absolute best 10,000 foot strategy. Yeah, I agree. And that's one of the big areas where I see a lot of businesses really fail is that 
they just don't do it consistently. You yeah. know, they have all these things that they say they're doing, you know, oh yeah, I'm on social media. Okay. When was the last time you posted? Uh, exactly. Probably like six weeks ago. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, they, they know what they have to do, yeah. but a lot of them just don't have the system in place to do it consistently. And so to kind of, to kind of start, you know, I mentioned marketing strategy, mentioned marketing plan. Uh, I think for a lot of people who may not be as well versed in marketing knowledge, they may yep. sound very synonymous. What is the difference though between a marketing plan and a marketing strategy? I think the the marketing plan is the is the actual, you know, these are the action steps I'm going to take to to do this. Mm -hmm. Whereas the strategy is, okay, I need to understand who it is I'm targeting, what their key issues are. Uh, what it is that they're actually looking for, what is their price point, all of the all of the research in the background that makes the plan effective, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's about who's the client, um, what are the key issues that they're fading, what is my unique value proposition that can then be presented to that client that they act right? It's it's great to have a unique value proposition that you know you can solve this problem, but if it's not a problem that's high on their priority it doesn't matter, right? And so the strategy is about understanding all of that so that you can turn it into a plan. And if you don't take the time to do that, the plan might be incredibly well thought out, but it could be completely ineffective because you don't know if it actually matters. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when we talk about that, you know, where then does someone begin with the strategy? Like where, if someone's like, hey, I don't have, a strategy at all, or maybe I'm looking to revise my strategy. Where's the first thing you tell them to look first? Yeah. My, uh, the, the thing that I have always taught advisors or other people when looking at marketing is look at your best customers, mm -hmm. right? The people, the people that you enjoy dealing with on a daily basis, the ones that, you know, have, have gone more from just being clients or customers to people that you that you want to have a relationship with, right? Those are mm -hmm. the people that you want to serve because you you are essentially in a service business. And so yeah. if if those are the people that you want to serve, then understanding that then becomes your ideal client profile. So choosing 10 of them, writing down all their commonalities, writing down the things that make them different, writing down what their key issues are, what they're using you for, that kind of thing. Then you can hone in on what you know, you're able to do for them that is unique. And so yeah. then you've got your ideal client profile, you can develop out your, your unique value proposition, and then you can move forward from there. So that's, yeah. that's where I would always start. So you talk about commonalities and differences. I mean, like what, what specifically should someone look at? I mean, is it, is it age? Is it like education level, income level? Like what kind of stuff do you suggest people look for? Yeah, those are, those are all important. So the, the demographic factors are, are mm -hmm. all important, but you have to look at, at qualitative factors as well. Um, so the, the types of individuals they are like in, from a personality perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the types of, of issues that they're facing, you know, are they, are they family people? Are they business oriented? What stage of business are they in? Is it, uh, if you're doing B2B, you know, yeah. is this a, a newcomer to the business? Is it somebody who's fairly experienced and is in an expansion period? Is it somebody who's doing succession planning? Um, mm -hmm. All those sorts of things. And, and so you want to look at all of those qualitative type uh, aspects as well. And, and you can create a list of them there. There's a list in my book, um, where you can look at that and understand what are the, all the important things that we should be, uh, figuring out about these, that, that, where there's a commonality that runs through all of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I know like we have a resource on our website that, that has this giant checklist, but I'm always interested in kind of hearing, you know, what other people look at and, and recommend just in terms of that demographic information, the qualitative information. And, and so, and, and what, what's interesting, I think is, you know, once you, like you said, find like 10 of your most favorite clients and, and the things that they have in common or the differences that they have. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times you'll see very obvious patterns start yeah. to emerge that, you know, yeah kind of tell you something that you may have already known, but like, you know, maybe it's like, you know, you clearly enjoy working with this specific type of product or service. And so now maybe that informs you that maybe you want to niche down a little bit further yeah. and just focus on that specific thing. 
Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you stop doing everything else. I, I think right. that's that's an issue that a lot of people have with the idea of niching down is mm -hmm. they believe, OK, now I can only do this one activity. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. It's just that when you are informing people of your specialty, mm -hmm. you inform them of that particular thing, because the more specific you make it, the easier it is for somebody to refer you somebody that fits within that niche. Right. Yeah. Because the more specific, the more the more they can they can um, materialize that that individual in their head to then provide you with a referral. Right. Yeah. And, and then I mean, and then that opens up other discussions about, OK, well, now you can potentially increase what you charge because you're seen yeah. as the specialist for that service. Exactly. But then at the same time, to your point, you still have this other bank of services that you offer That's right. over time. You're explaining to people, hey, these are some other things I do. They already trust you yeah. because you did something great for them before. And they're they're not even going to think twice about like, oh, okay, well, go ahead and do this for me too. They're not, you yeah. know, it, it just it makes everything beyond that initial conversion so much easier. That's right. That's right. The the cross sell becomes a thousand times easier once you've established credibility because of specialization. Yeah. So the other element then uh, to marketing strategy is building out your sales funnel. And, and you know, yeah. we've talked a little bit before just about the concept of a marketing funnel. Um, you know, you have the top of the funnel, which is where all of your cold leads come in, where yeah. they become kind of aware of your business. And the ultimate hope is that they work their way down this, you know, theoretical funnel down to the bottom where they're super red hot and they make a buying decision. And hopefully yeah. that decision is yes. Yeah. What to you are some of the key elements of that sales funnel that would make it the most effective that it could be? Yeah. Uh, can I take us one step back before we get to the sales funnel? Absolutely. I think is an important step that a lot of people miss. So I, I call it a product staircase. So I, okay. I think that that everybody needs to have an understanding of where you are trying to lead a prospective client, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the 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 model that is working incredibly well from a marketing perspective right now is like a freemium model, right? Mm -hmm. Where you are providing something, knowledge, uh, uh, templates, uh, whatever it may be, uh, consultation for free, and then you are gradually moving them up in a in a service model you have your freemium product then you have a a discount product then you move to a mid-tier market product and then you move to your premium product and so the sales funnel is really meant to get them into the freemium or or the the low ticket options and yeah. then move them up until they become core clients that are you know the majority of of you know wallet in your industry is being spent with you yeah. So uh, once you've once you've done that, once you've established how what are my what are my products going to be products or services on this on this staircase, then you can move to building your your funnel and and the funnel, you know, you've got you feed all your leads at the top. This mm -hmm. is where the freemium model works incredibly well is is having some type of ad that drives to some type of free product in order to get access to to individuals to earn the right to collect their information. Right, their their email, their name, their phone number, those sorts of things. Whether that be, uh, you know, for mortgage brokers, it's calculators and and um, you know things that are going to documents on on interest rates for for lawyers. It, it may be, um, you know, previous court cases that have ramifications on a particular topic, or um, you know, an analysis, uh, free consultation, those sorts of things to drive them into the funnel. And then there's communication and dripping along the way. So so yep. depending on where they enter in your funnel, whether it's top of the funnel with lead magnets, that sort of thing, then you know middle of funnel where you have regular communication with them through email marketing, through um, you know regular follow up calls, those sorts of things to the actual yeah. por purchasing part. And I think one of the most important things for building a funnel is understanding heuristics. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if, if you've, uh, talked about heuristics on, on the podcast before, we have not. but I would say they're one of the most important things that people can learn about. So there's this exceptional book called the science of selling by a, a gentleman named David Hoffeld, and he talks about heuristics and how they affect our decision-making process, uh, that, that our brain uses. So essentially if you wanted to make a decision and you didn't have heuristics, uh, it would take you forever to make that decision you, because you have to consider all of the potential for that decision. 
what heuristics do is there are a set of biases in your brain that allow you to make very, very quick decisions to eliminations and to select the, mo the most likely to be successful options out of a decision-making process. So things like anchoring bias, uh, the single option bias, um, uh, you know, all, all kinds of really, really interesting brain decisions that that we make. Um, one of my favorites is is the single in the event that you only give a potential client or a lead or prospect, whatever you want to call it, uh, one option. This is this mm -hmm. from us, right? They are yeah. more likely to say no than they are yes, because your brain defaults to saying no to single options. Mm -hmm. If you give them two to three choices, they're yeah. much more likely to choose one of those two to three choices because their brain doesn't have that bias to automatically say no. It now wants to choose one of those. And what we do a lot of the time is we put our cheapest option first, right? Mm -hmm. And then build up to our more expensive options. We should be reversing that. You should have the most expensive option first because that's your anchor, right? At that point, everything else seems like it's a deal. And so if you do most expensive, mid-tier option, cheapest option, the the consumer is likely to go to the middle option because it doesn't seem like a, like a, a budget option, but it's also not the most expensive. And so you can lay things out in terms of where you put your, your call to actions on a, on a lead magnet or on an email or all these things taking heuristics into consideration and massively expedite the decision-making process to get to yes. And yeah. so you're saying take this into consideration yeah no and that's that's really interesting because like now my mind is is racing just in how things you know how we have things set up you know internally here at spotlight branding one other kind of you know way i wanted to ask you this and, and maybe it'll help people visualize it you know i think i think a lot of times funnels are you know imagined very literally like a, a literal funnel like you have yeah. like for your car to pour oil into or something yeah. but could it also almost be because it in some ways it sounds like this is almost what you're describing it's almost more like a flow chart mm -hmm. than a literal funnel because now you're giving people options yeah so you say hey do you want this or this and now depending on what they say now it goes to this set of landing pages yeah. or this set of landing pages, or, or however you're building it Yes, exactly. So, you know, um, if you use a, an email management software, like uh, mm -hmm. I use ConvertKit. Um, in ConvertKit, you can build a whole bunch of different visual automations and you can have it so that that if they click on a particular link, it, it puts a tag on them that then drives them into a totally different funnel. So you can have, you can have this, you know, typical shaped funnel, but the funnel right. actually has outlets that run into different funnels for, for unique, uh, offerings, right? Yeah. So if I if I know I have a huge portion of my um, my client base that isn't going to buy a particular premium product, they're yeah. they're they're a a discount purchaser. They they only buy things that are that are now on sale. I can move them into a different funnel that sells them a discount a series of discounted products, right? Because yeah. I know they're more interested in that. And then the ones that don't never click on a discounted deal that are more interested in premium stuff, you funnel them into a different conversation. So they're getting more custom, more bespoke type offerings. And, yeah. and so you can do all these sorts of things with the data that we get now, right? right. Just by, by tagging and, and tracking and analyzing what your, your potential customers are actually doing. Yeah. And, and then I, I think for us, a, a key element here is to have, you know, it goes back to, to your you know point about consistency, you know, early on, the, the key is to have consistent touch points beyond just that drip sequence. So, you know, because yeah. maybe, you know, maybe you set up each one to have like a 10 email drip sequence. Mm -hmm. And like the, the whole goal is that by the 10th email, they've made a buying decision of some sort, but maybe people don't do that. Or, yeah. you know, you want to, well, be they able just to may not be people. ready, right? Like, yeah, you've exactly. Got You've got less than 10% of all people are ready to buy a product right now, right? right. It's, it's it, There's a lot of research that says it's 3%. 3% right. of the population is ready to buy your product right now. So you, you, you know, you get a three people out of every hundred that you add to your, to your funnel are, are potentially a buyer. Um, right. And so you, you have to, it's not just about trying to push them through this, this 10 sequence, but it's about 
marketing is is about them knowing your brand so that when the problem comes to light, they are ready to buy from you right then. Right. Right. Yeah. It's almost it's almost like and I might have just stumbled on like a real stroke of genius as we're talking. You know, it's almost like, you know, you're marketing as like a sports team and your entire goal is to get someone into your stadium. Yeah. And then your hope is to keep them in the stadium for as long as possible. That's, I mean, that's, that's essentially what Instagram and Facebook and everything do, right? Their algorithm is designed just to keep you on it so that yeah. you view ads so that one of them, just one might be successful in, in selling you something, right? It, it's right. about just keeping eyes on you. That's, yeah. that's the whole goal. Right. Yeah. And so once they're in now, you just, you know, you have those ongoing touch points and, and a, and a marketing system that that's outside of this funnel. It's not just the funnel. You have yeah. to keep, you know, creating those touch points. And so that's, I, you know, I think that's a really great way to visualize, you know, all of that, that, that going on. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned it a couple yeah. of times is uh, the unique value proposition. So yeah. what exactly is that and why is it important? Yeah, it's, I would say it's one of the most important things is understanding what it is that you can do for your, the person you want to serve that mm -hmm. is unique to other people. Yeah. Um, and I think the the challenge is that the, the consuming public sees a lot of professions as all the same, mm -hmm. right? We, we look at, you know, coming from the finance side, people look at financial advisors and go, they're all the same. They all mm -hmm. have the same products. They all have access to the same stuff. They all do the same thing, right? Why would I deal with one over another? Right. And so the position is, is so important to identify where you're able to help somebody other people are not able to or un, are unwilling to or that you can just do it better than than the rest, right? So mm -hmm. I I specialized in, in working with... Uh, Selling in working with advisors that were interested in growing their practice, right? And so I I focused on helping them to identify where they could uh, add a lot of value for their clients. A lot of this was in incorporated professionals, those sorts of things, because I thought about how to market to them, how what type of products were important, the key areas of concern were that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, you know, you could go into any specific area into in Canada in particular for people like architects, right? They, they're they not able to buy traditional investment securities or the, or they should limit themselves in, in purchasing it because they have additional liability considerations that are unique to their profession. And so if I was a, an advisor that wanted to specifically work with architects, I would have a very unique value proposition in, I understand the problems that face your particular uh, your particular situation, because I've dealt with this before and I can help you better than anybody else is, who's more of a generalist and is only going to help you to accomplish a financial plan, but not necessarily protect you from additional liabilities, right? right. It's the same in law. It's the same in, in accounting. It's the same. All these different places is, is really about understanding who they are, what their, their core problem is and how you particularly can help them. And so it, a series of question uh, of questions to help you identify what your unique value proposition is, and eventually it just leads you to an area where you essentially that says, yeah. "This is what my unique value proposition is. This is how I would present what I do to people that ask me for a living." Yeah, and I think you know that's the real key differentiator there because uh, you know you don't want because I, I see a ton of businesses still do this where their whole unique value proposition is either like, oh, we have the best customer service or we have the, you know, we we're the, you know, we charge the lowest rates in town. And that's not unique. No. Like, no, it's got to be, a, it's got to go deeper than that. It has to, it has to. And it, and it needs to be focused on the client. I, yeah. I think this is, this is, uh, I've said it a couple of times. The point that we all forget about is that it's, you know, we're providing service, that we are yeah. serving these people and, yeah. and that, you know, until you get that into your head that that you are you are serving somebody else and their needs, it yeah. becomes very difficult to 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 figure out what it is that your unique value proposition is, because yeah. price is not unique. Right. Yeah. So uh, all of this put together, 
you know, you have, you know, your different elements of a marketing strategy. Are there any other elements that, that we've missed? Or if not, you know, what then, you know, how do you implement it? How often do you update it? You know, what are the next steps? Yeah, I, I would probably be, you know, on an annual basis or your plan, which includes like a content marketing plan, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I call it a content whirlpool. So okay. the idea is that you, this, this whirlpool of content that is swirling around your potential prospect that, you know, they pick out the pieces that are important to them. Surely, you know, one strikes and, and finds them at the right time, but you should, you should probably be building out your plan on an annual basis, updating it quarterly, uh, mm -hmm. Because there are particularly for niche industries like finance or law or or accounting, you know, where you have tax code changes or you have uh, legal changes, these sorts of things. There are opportunities within that that are specific to your niche niche audience um, that you can utilize to be uh, ahead of of your competition um, that you can then create turn into content those sorts of things so if you have a tax law change that affects people's ability to use uh registered plans or 401ks or whatever it may be um down in the states you know you you want to be on top of that in being able to go to your clients and say hey this is something really interesting that's changing here's an opportunity in order to address one of your particular needs um so being able to adjust on a quarterly basis from the content that you're producing and and you know how you're communicating with clients that sort of thing is is really important awesome love it so um how can people learn more about you learn more about the book and stay in touch with you um so you can find me on linkedin uh just warren miles pickup uh i'd love to connect with people on there find me on uh twitter um at d-u-b-m-p um and then have the website coming out in the next couple of weeks which will be marketing motivators.xyz um that'll be launching uh with the book and you'll be able to uh order the book on amazon um and then what else uh yeah you'll be able to communicate with me through email all that sort of thing Awesome. Love it. So yeah, a ton of great information here. I, you know, I got my wheels turning and just maybe some different things that we can try with, with our own funnels and, and, and all of that. And so uh, I know usually when I learn something, I know the audience walks away with, with a lot of good information as well. Uh, one final question for you before we wrap yep. up here. Fire away. And that is if you had one final piece of advice for our audience, what would it be? Ooh, good question. Um, one final piece of advice do something that you love make sure make sure that that uh what you're doing is something you are truly passionate about because people buy passion they they yeah. they're not buying a product they're buying that you are passionate in solving a problem and so if if you really care about what you're doing it's really easy for other people to get on board with it they 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 buy your why not your what exactly thank you yeah. simon sinek yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I love that. And and that really does tie into to everything that we talked about here, because you build your marketing strategy, you focus on the things that you really enjoy doing. And, yeah. you know, it, your passion just naturally comes through, especially with all the messaging that you create around it. So yeah, exactly. that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you for continuing to listen, rating and reviewing the show wherever you're watching or listening from. And that's going to do it. Warren, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. To learn more, go to spotlightbranding.com slash center stage.